Good evening, guys. Welcome back to another credit card news live stream. I just want to give a quick shout out to Raul. You just got a credit limit increase to uh, from four thousand eight hundred dollars to twenty thousand dollars. Congratulations, man. Congrats on that. 
So, and that was on your Best Buy Citibank card. So I believe I have that card as well. And I only have a $10,000 limit on that. Uh, but listen, that's a, that's a huge improvement, dude. That's what's a 5X increase on that. And I'm interested, if you could let us know exactly what you did to get, what do you think you did to get that increase? Yeah, a few data points would be great. Danny, thank you for the super chat. I see you always supporting. I really appreciate it, Danny. So, um, hope everybody had a good weekend so far. We're going to get right into the news here. Pull this thing on up. All right, so we're going to start, actually, we're going to start here. Um, so there's a red flag. Consumers are using buy now, pay later to cover everyday expenses. So buy now, pay later installment plans have become popular among consumers seeking to spread out the cost of big ticket purchases. But now rising prices have some cash strapped shoppers reaching for these alternative payment methods for everyday purchases, such as their daily coffee, gas station fill ups or the you know typical grocery run as well. That's a concern for economists and consumer advocates who say the surge in the use of these services coupled with a lack of transparency and little regulatory oversight leaves them wondering just how much debt Americans are actually getting into. While other household debt such as credit card spending and auto loans is gathered and tracked by the Federal Reserve, buy now, pay, buy now, pay later, try saying that three times, buy now, pay later, um, data is not included because the financing is typically provided by non-bank sources and not yet reported in a comprehensive manner to credit bureaus. So I think, you know, that they're kind of a little off base here because we see the main the main three credit bureaus, um, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, are adding buy now, pay later uh, tracking into their, um, into their calculations. Um, and I think they're going to be incorporated we, we, we've been seeing news around this. I, I feel like buy now, pay later is pretty straightforward. You, they put you on an installment plan, whether it be four weeks, six months, or a year. And if you pay within that amount of time, then you pay no interest. Now they have what's called deferred interest, where they'll charge you as if they'll charge you interest on the full amount of the purchase if you don't pay that, um, that loan off in the in the you know given time that you uh, promised from that from the beginning so that could be an issue but I, I feel like they're pretty straightforward i personally don't use i wouldn't use buy now pay later for average purchases just because you could use a, a credit card and get cash back or you get you know travel uh benefits and and points you could be part of a point system if you're you know the, the with the chase trifecta or the amex trifecta so I really don't see a, a reason to use buy now, pay later in place of a credit card. Like, why would you do that? I only The only case I could see using that is if you're purchasing a large item, maybe you're buying a laptop that's $2,000 or a refrigerator that's $3,000. That makes a lot of sense to me. Or like I, I bought a couch and I use, uh, for, I think I used um, a firm uh, a few years back when I bought like a couch that was like $3,000. So it made sense in that situation, but not for a coffee, not for filling up your gas tank. I know this is more expensive these days, but that that's a bit much to use buy now, pay later for that purpose. Next we have, is voice payment going to be the next big thing? In India, the current winds of change appear to be in favor of adoption of voice-based payment technology. The voice-based smart assistant revolution what started in Siri and Alexa is now being lauded as the key enabler for a large percentage of the population to go on board with digital payments. Traditional digital payment is a reliable method, but its necessities are as it necessitates constant checking of account numbers, cross-checking among application, applications, among other things. As a result, voice technology ushers in a new era of digital payments that is far too quick and handy. So I don't, you know, I know you can do this with, um, with Amazon. If you have an Alexa device, I, I personally only have Google home devices around my house, but, um, with Alexa, you can just ask for, you know, more toilet paper or what have you. And it'll purchase. I've never used that feature, but I, I don't know. I don't know the, of this catching on. 
I haven't heard anybody discussing this. Let me know in the comments section, you know, have you used a voice based, you know, have you made any transactions just using your voice around the house? Cause that seems a little, a little, you know, iffy to me. Cause I don't know. I want to see the listing. I want to see the reviews for it. I want to see some specific, like I'm, I'm fine making a purchase quickly. I do that all the time, but I need to see it's got, you know, good reviews and it's a decent price. And so some, you know, you can't really do that just by ordering with your voice. So next we have consumer financial bureau is out of control under Biden's direction. Um, and, uh, some critics say after one of the federal government's most powerful bureaucrats warned he would be reining in repeat offenders. The nation's largest business group wants to rein in his powers. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce launched a six-figure digital ad campaign in late June targeting Rohit Chopra, director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, appointed by President Biden in 2021 and confirmed without a single Republican vote. So, I mean, listen, this is going to balance. They're trying to do, you know... And I've been hearing a lot of news recently about the... Uh, we, I think we have a, another story here where they're trying to stop uh, junk fees in the credit card industry. And they're, they're really been at the kind of the forefront in the, in the news in recent months trying to make these changes. So maybe it's in response to that. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but uh, looks like they're trying to push back a little bit on that agency. All right, so JD Power um, is saying debit credit card um, use is still outpacing alternative payment methods. Debit and credit card transactions continue to lead the way in payment transactions over digital payment alternatives, according to a recent research published uh, by JD Power. Um, across all groups of US consumers in the last three months, 32% turned to their debit card most frequently to pay, and 28% used their credit card, trailing behind cards where, um, where ATM withdrawals, 12%. Cash, which was 11%, check at 6%, and mobile wallet at 2%. That's that's actually surprising there. Um, other alternatives such as peer-to-peer -peer payment apps, prepaid or gift cards, buy now, pay later, and cryptocurrencies were each used by only 1% of consumers in that same three-month period, according to the survey. I think the, listen, I think that uh, digital wallet should be a little bit higher. I, I think I've seen some conflicting data on that. Um... I personally use my digital wallet for all my purchases when I go to the grocery store. I go to the grocery store, I use, um, it's it's a whole routine. Open my phone, um, I select, and it, it should be by default, the city custom cash card. And uh, I have that, you can access that through my website, just city custom cash card. Could not recommend that card enough. You get top, you get 5% cash back in your top spending category. So. It's really effective. I just redeemed uh, earlier today. I, I looked at my account. I have two city custom cash cards, right? I redeemed uh, one of the cards I had 50 bucks on. So I redeemed that. And then on the other card, I had about $25 on. So, it, and I, I redeemed that for a statement credit. So it was nice to get that, um, get that money back. And it's, it's so simple to use that. Um, and I use one for uh, grocery purchases and I use another for it's kind of floating but at, at the moment i'm using it for dining out and delivery purchases so um yeah i couldn't recommend that enough but i don't see why you would be using your debit card when you could easily use your credit card for most of your purchases you could get the um you know you could get access to that cash back those features you know all the protections that you get from purchasing with a card um like uh, you know uh, item protection and you get uh you get the grace period i can't i can't stress that enough you get a 25 at least a 25 day grace period before you have to pay it back so you're using other people's money in the meantime and if there's some sort of problem with your transaction then you have a lot more recourse you can complain and say hey this was fraudulent and they're much more um uh, likely to work with you and refund that money it's just um, it, it just, it's just more pleasant to work with a credit card issuer as opposed to trying to get money that was taken from your debit card. And it might take, you know, what days or weeks to work that out. Um, 
uh, in the back end. I think at this point, you know, I used to only use uh, cash for utility purchases, but I moved over to using the US Bank Cash Plus card, which we'll talk about later. I use that for utilities and I get 5% cash back. And that just requires you to um, activate the specific category that um, you want to earn 5% in. And then you can activate uh, another two categories to earn 2% back in. But it's a really good card to use for utilities because so few cards have access to that uh, spending category. And also that's on my website. You can find that through the cashback link. So uh, next story, Bank of America says consumer spending remains resilient despite inflation. So Bank of America said customer spending continues to show signs of resilience um, despite surging inflation with pent up demand for travel and leisure countering rising gas prices and other increased costs. Spending on credit and debit cards was up 11% from a year earlier in June, compared with a 13% increase in April and 9% gain in May. The bank said on Thursday, the higher spending comes amid rising prices and fears that the U.S. is poised to slide into a recession. So I've, I've been seeing more and more stories saying that U.S. consumers are using their credit cards to kind of offset the the rising gas prices and the price of food and they're shifting and using debt to help basically just ease that pain and get them from you know check to check which is a bad thing to do you always want to pay these cards off pay that statement balance every single month and unfortunately most people are revolvers and they're not doing that and they're just carrying a balance all right next we have uh the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB, warns debt collectors about fees. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued an advisory opinion warning debt collectors that most pay-to-pay -pay fees that they often charge violate federal law. These charges commonly described by debt collectors as convenience, convenience fees, are imposed on consumers who want to make a payment in a particular way such as online or by phone. This new advisory opinion is another step in the CFPB's crusade against junk fees. So this is like, I wanna highlight, if I could just highlight crusade. Can I highlight this right here? That is important because this basically is saying that they they have made this they um, their largest kind of focal point they are hammering this home it's it's a very big issue and they're they're going to bat on this um and this is probably why the um the businesses are upset um and they say but it adds a new approach that may save resources for the agency while being as equally effective as a new rule so this is a great thing this is really good for consumers right i mean if you're trying to pay off a debt a debt collector calls you which I hope they never do, then you don't want to be charged, you know, an arm and a leg, or you don't want to be nickel and dimed just to pay the debt that you owe. You should just be able to pay that debt, no matter the payment method. It's just, it's terrible to have to go through that. So, Next story, we have how retailers are approaching cryptocurrency payments. And I think I saw uh, Cinemanis. What's up? Welcome uh, back to the chat. Uh, I saw you talking about crypto earlier, and we're going to discuss that. But that has been a huge fall, right? I've been like, I I've always told people I've been entertained by the crypto, um, uh, basically the sector, the, the, the whole, I call it gambling. And I've always discouraged anybody that would hear me against trying to invest i don't consider that investment but i mean listen you have to make your own decision and this is not you know i can't i can't officially advise you but i mean we see the huge plummet that cryptos had and people are hurting out there so in, in kind of uh, in relation to that um this is about how uh, retailers 
are handling these crypto payments. So recently released a re uh, Deloitte recently released a report on its survey of 2000 senior executives at US retail companies to examine interest and investment in their crypto as a form of payment. The report found that 64% of merchants surveyed indicated that their customers have a significant interest in crypto payment options. 83% expect that interest to grow over the next year. I call that's cap, right? Like, come on now. I don't see interest growing and in, at least in the near future, I don't see interest. I, f I see it waning. I, s I, f I see the interest in crypto falling off a cliff at the moment. There's a lot of FUD at the moment, a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And we saw just from the last study that uh, crypto purchases are an exceedingly low part um, of, of people's payment methods or what they choose to pay with. And so he says, and 83% expect that interest to grow over the next year. Based on this data, many companies are looking at the long-term role of crypto in retail transactions, perhaps expecting the current user demographic to grow and change over time. Crypto users aren't too swayed by market fluctuations, according to a study by Gartner's software advice. But, you know, I discussed this before. How could you, uh, you know, want to go out? Just think about this. You plan a trip to go out shopping. Maybe, for example, you want new sneakers. And so in the morning you get up, you, you plan in, you plan to go out to Foot Locker or wherever to get some new sneakers. You look at your account, you see your Bitcoin is worth, you know, a hundred dollars. You have a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. By the time you get to Foot Locker, it's worth $80. How, like, how would you feel trying to make that transaction? You just had more money, considerably more money, but now you possibly can't even afford to buy the shoes that you wanted in the amount of time it took you to get to the store. That's, that's insane to me. But um, yeah, that's, that's what people have to contend with. So I, I don't see the interest growing. I think this is, this is going to be a huge waste of time. All right. So Apple is eyeing fuel purchases from the dashboard as it revs up uh, car software. So here's what they're doing. Apple wants you to start buying gas directly from your car dashboard as early as this fall. When the newest version of its CarPlay software rolls out, accelerating the company's push to turn your vehicle into a store for goods and services. I think this is smart. A new feature quietly unveiled at Apple's developer conference this month will allow CarPlay users to tap an app to navigate to a pump and buy gas straight from a screen in the car, skipping the usual process of inserting a or tapping a credit card. You know, actually, as I read through this, I love it more and more because locally, I've been having a real issue getting gas because the terminals just don't work properly. I don't know who, you know, if they contracted out to certain uh, different like third party companies, but they're either slow or they're broken. They gotta be reset. I have to insert my car multiple times. It just, it's not a good experience. And then, I mean, you don't want to have to touch another public kind of have another public touch point. You're touching doorknobs and, you know, so it's like a, uh, you know, it's a hygiene thing, right? You don't want to touch excessively, you know, more keypads than you have to. So I actually, you know, I like that, uh, that feature. Um, I mean, you could also go the route of using, uh, the digital wallet and just kind of tap and pay. That's another way you could go but that still requires you to touch interface with the screen at some point but i think this could be uh this could be a good uh a good way to to get more people um oh, well obviously this is going to be great for for business for apple because anytime you transact with uh you push a transaction through apple pay they get a cut so this is definitely in their best interest um you know profit wise uh but i could see myself trying this out and then, um, and for, I just want to speak to women for, for a second. I want to speak to women. I know that it's, it's a pain point. It's a struggle going to that gas station and you can let me know in the comment section, do you kind of dread going to the gas station? Um, I've been hearing about this more and more you, that it's, it's kind of a problem and you you would kind of like to avoid that. So as much as you could avoid the gas station as possible, spend less time there, less time outside of your vehicle. I know you would probably appreciate that, but let me know how you feel in the comments.
All right, next story, we have understanding 3D credit card security and how it could affect your trips to other countries. The credit card security technology 3D Secure, or 3DS for short, as it's sometimes called, helps verify whether online transactions are, are authentic. It checks a number of factors to authenticate a purchase, including the location of the user, the history of the purchases on that credit card, and even whether the personal data provided during the transaction matches what the bank has on file. If the technology identifies any abnormalities during this verification process, it may institute an additional security check via text message, email, or phone call before completing the purchase. Users that benefit from an improved experience with a simpler transaction. Banks benefit from reduced fraud and chargebacks. And merchants benefit by having an easier process for consumers so that they actually complete the transaction and spend money with the merchant. You know, so I, I see this already in use. And I, I'm guessing that it's maybe it's not in use so much for international travel, but you know, I, I see it every day. I, maybe once or twice a week, sometimes I'll go out and I'll, uh, I'll be using my SoFi credit card and which uh, earns 2% across all purchases and categories. And if, if I'm making a purchase that's kind of abnormal, kind of off the beaten path for me, then I'll notice it'll just instantly be declined and I'll get a text message saying, hey, press Y, is this you or no? Is, is it fraudulent? And so that used to be a big problem in the past. I know people used to complain all the time about having to call in the customer service, but I, I'm glad that that's an issue that we don't really have to deal with too much because as soon as you send that text, it just takes a second, just, you know, text Y and then send and then make the transaction again and it goes through. So I, I think it's a pretty good uh, system they have set up. All right, so I want to let you guys know if you haven't been paying attention to, to my community page, um, I posted that uh, with my U.S. Bank Cash Plus card, which I use for um, utility purchases, I get 5% back on that. I got upgraded. I got my credit limit increased to $7,500. And my previous limit was, I didn't want to say it, I was a little, I was a little embarrassed. I started out the beginning of the year with a $500 credit limit. And... I wasn't very familiar with U.S. Bank, so I didn't know when um, I would have an opportunity to increase my limit. I knew 500 was absolutely too low because, you know, I you never know. Like I, I have oil heat and I have, you know, electricity bill and a water bill. So sometimes that can easily go over 500 bucks. So it was a bit of a problem. I just continue to pay off the card. I use between $100 to $300 per month. And lo and behold, right as the the six month passed and my six statement came out, um, they automatically increased my limit all the way up to seven thousand five hundred. I'd never expected that to happen. Um, uh, I never expected a, an, an increase that large. And I feel like seven thousand five hundred is where I should have started at. So maybe they just reevaluated me um, with the same um you know, income and the same uh, uh, indicators and data points and and just open it up and evaluate it me as I should have been from the beginning. So if, if you if you have a U.S. bank card, just know that the six month mark seems to be a uh, a really good time to get reevaluated and get that increase uh, going for you. And I want to let you guys know about the Apple card. And, I, and just by the way, before I even say this, I really hope that Apple, please, Apple, if you ever see this, make some significant updates to your Apple card. You launched it in 2019. You know, you came out with a lot of buzz. A lot of people love the way you're making, you know, um, offering credit limit increases. People are getting those high limits. They love it. But people want more 3% categories. And, you know, in addition, you're doing a pretty good job of expanding Apple Pay. So it's essentially becoming a, you know, a flat rate 2% card, but they want more 3% categories. Let me know if you want the same thing for your Apple card. Uh, but right now they're offering a promotion 
one of the one of their promotions is you can get one hundred dollars daily cash once you have a co-owner join join with you. So the co-owner that you um, that you add will get one hundred dollars once they make their first purchase. So it's a pretty good deal um, to you know if you have uh, to, you know you have a spouse, you have a significant significant other, long term, whatever. Get you can easily get a hundred bucks if you just join accounts up. All right, so I wanted to touch on this, um, and actually another thing that I don't even have a slide on, but we're gonna get to a Synchrony Bank, Danny. You know about what I'm I'm gonna mention a little bit later. So, uh, but here the law firm is a one law firm is investigating a new class action lawsuit against Zelle. Uh, the bank's name by the law firm uh, are Bank of America, Capital One, JP Morgan, Chase, PNC, Truist, U.S. Bank, and Wells Fargo. Despite federal laws requiring the reimbursement of unauthorized electronic funds transfers, several major U.S. banks have refused to cover some customers' fraud claims and related to scams taking place on the Zelle payment system, which is owned and operated by the consortium of banks listed above. So um, I know a lot of you uh, probably interested in Zelle. That's that's one of the features that the SoFi uh, account is missing. I hope they add that this year. SoFi, if you're listening, add Zelle because we want access to that peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, payment system because it just, it just effortlessly works with all the major banks. We want that. Um, it's it's interesting it seems like they're being a little bit too conservative with their payouts when people have an issue so I, i'm really interested to see what becomes of this lawsuit and if it's valid um, but just be aware of that next here's a story from reddit and i thought this was uh this was an interesting story here so he says paying with points on a group trip and you guys, let me know what you think about this because everybody's probably going to have a slightly different answer. So I'm going on an upcoming trip with friends. I am one of the only ones with a credit card. So I offered to book the hotel on my card and they will sell or Venmo me. One of them asked if I had a credit card with points I could use. I do have points, but they are my perks. They are the perks that I get. Is there etiquette to booking for a group using points? Just because they are points, they are still earned by me by my spending and worth to me. They're worth money to me. If I pay with points, should should they still be expected to pay me back for the monetary value of the booking? What do you think? I mean, you could go either way. I, I feel like I, I, the, here's the top answer. They're saying I would not book with points and just say I don't have enough. If you're going to book with points, then you should let them know um, how much you value the points at. Um, so what what are what's the equivalent monetary value of those points? So, you know, I, I personally, I, I sort of agree with that. I don't even want to kind of mix it up. I don't even want to make it more complex than it needs to be. I kind of lean into maybe just split the payments. You don't, you know, if, if everybody can easily pay on their own in some way, I, I think that's the best case scenario. We don't want to introduce any more complexity than necessary. But if you do end up paying with your credit card, I wouldn't even involve the points. I would just keep that, keep hold that back for your own future purchases and just have them straight up pay you whatever the cost of the hotel would be. That's, that's the way I personally would do it. But let me know how you would, you would handle that. I just want to see what you guys say here. Raul, you're saying they shouldn't be traveling if they're only going to carry cash and have no cards at all. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe they shouldn't be. Hey, they just have debit cards. That's it. Listen, you know, I, I, I remember I polled you guys, maybe it was probably two months ago. And I asked you, how, how many, how many of you 
have um, a friend or family member that that's into credit cards and you know what most of you said uh, overwhelmingly it was y'all said no that you're kind of the only one that was interested in cards and using cards and you know getting cash back and all the perks so I know it's it's interesting because a lot of people have cards like most of America has credit cards but most people don't know what their card does they don't know the limits of the card they don't know a, like a shocking amount of information they don't know about their card so i don't i don't find it like surprising that this group of friends uh doesn't or maybe it's a little surprising they don't have a card at all but listen they're trying to they're trying to look for uh uh a discount why, why would they want a discount on your dime basically they're saying that i want you to pay more money than me because you already earned the points you're going to lower the, the price for everybody and you're going to end up subsidizing the trip that's not fair that's not fair for for you What's up, Cheryl? How you doing? You're saying points are golden. I agree. Points are points are golden. That's money. All right. And I just want to let you know, Webull still has that deal going on until the end of this month. If you uh, sign up for an account, you deposit one penny, you'll get anywhere from $34 to a few thousand dollars back in stock. So that's a really good deal. They're still running. And this is what it looks like once you deposit a cent, just one penny will get you six free stocks. So check that out. I have that in a pinned comment in this video and it's in the description. And you'll it'll this is what it'll look like once your stocks uh, transaction has completed. And then after that, you'll be able to uh, withdraw the money right into your account. And if you are interested in signing up for any cashback cards, travel cards, I have access to those on my website. This is what it looks like. And that's it, calbartoncashback.com. So I saw I saw that um Raul, you had the increase. Did anybody else get a uh, credit limit increase over the past week? Margaret, how you doing? I, th I don't think I've seen you here before. Welcome to the stream. You're saying, how do I share this video? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there should be some. You should have access to that at the bottom below, like right above the description of the video. There should be like a share icon, like a little arrow curving out, I believe. All right, Danny, you're saying that you applied for the Amex Blue Business Plus and got approved for $10,000. Okay, listen, you get into the money. You get into the money, I like it. 10, 10K, that's nothing to scoff at. 10K, I always say this, 10K is like everybody's um, ideal credit limit. So the fact that you're starting out at that is is awesome. And what are the perks of the Amex Blue Business? And just so everybody knows, you can get a business card um, just as a sole proprietor. Uh, a lot of people don't know that still. So um, a sole proprietor is just someone you're, you're basically working under your own name. You're you you. It's basically the 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 least amount of work that you have to do to uh, establish yourself as a business. And you could be like working on a side hustle you could be selling things on ebay or amazon you know fba you, you could do uh side work and gigs if you're doing like upwork or fiverr if you do like you know social media stuff you're man managing accounts whatever you you have it's just the simplest way to um kind of 
establish a business as a sole proprietor. Then you say it gives you a 2% cash back to at 2x points. Nice. I know that's a very, that's a, that's a, a popular card. I saw it mentioned on the forums and speaking, Danny, speaking of that, I'm glad that I, uh, that I'm speaking to you right now. Um, so Danny, uh, let me know that there's a, another person that, that basically is sounding the alarm about Synchrony Bank. And I don't want to, I don't want to make too much of this because it, they seem to be pretty isolated incidents, but they're happening at a, at a frequency that could that is concerning where synchrony bank uh has a lot of co-branded cards for example the amazon store card the verizon visa card the venmo credit card and many others and they they have a practice a business practice where they'll they'll cancel your credit card accounts you could so this guy he had uh multiple accounts with synchrony bank cards that had limits upwards of $30,000, $20,000, woke up one morning and those cards were completely closed out and canceled. And they can do that. Any credit card issuer can cancel your card and they can just give you a, whatever reason they want. It's they're, The agencies are pretty lenient on them when it comes to reasoning. So even when they deny you for credit limit increases or they deny you for access uh, or getting approved for the card, they can just kind of give you a canned response. And so that's not really fair, but they they kind of get away with it. So just be on be on the lookout, Synchrony Bank. Just be aware that if you have a lot of Synchrony cards, you want to diversify um, the the credit cards that you have from the uh, from different credit card issuers. So if you have Synchrony cards, make sure you go out and get a Chase card, or you get a um, a credit union card with you know with your local bank, or you have a card with um, Capital One. I know a lot of you don't like Capital One, but you know, whatever it, your issuer of choice is, you want to diversify those limits so that if any one credit issuer has a problem with you for whatever reason, doomsday scenario, that you're not going to be left with a completely decimated available credit limit, you know? And this happened personally to Danny as well. And so just be aware of that. All right. Bro, that, that's a shame. That's a shame right there. You're saying my 15 year old Capital One card has a credit limit of 750. Yeah, that, that's, that's such a long time. That's, I think that's, that's about the time that I have my, uh, from my first card. It's a shame that they, you would have thought that at this point in time, they would have just randomly increased your limit just 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 to see what you would do with it chris what's up man you're saying hey cal i'm really starting to get into credit cards and i know we're talking about increases but i have cards already nine plus years on each a quicksilver car and a venture one am i ineligible for the venture x no and listen, I would have you looked into uh, Capital One's um, upgrade portal. They have a they have a landing page. I have a links in a few videos where you can just you know uh, easily see. It's a soft pull, and you can see if they are offering you 
upgrades on each card have you tried that yet just going through that process um to see if they they already offer you an upgrade yeah cheryl that's a good point have you updated your income there's a there's a lot of you know factors when they um when they're approving you for a credit limit increase that I, I believe they're looking for. And I, my, the, the way that I'm kind of, uh, developing a strategy is, is trying to use all the benefits and features of any given credit card. It's as many features as you can to, to give them as many data points saying, Hey, I'm using a card. I'm really loving the, um, the this the the features of the card i'm i'm participating in the offers that you're giving me and i'm using the card in ways that are valuable are profitable for you the bank and i, I believe that is the uh that's the mindset that i have when i'm looking to increase limits and that that takes a form and that takes different forms depending on the credit card issuer because some issuers will offer you a zero percent interest balance transfers or other credit card issuers will offer you upgrade pass. So just depending on that issuer is going to kind of dictate, um, so kind of the best, uh, pathway to increasing your limit. Yeah. So Chris, you're saying that you product changed already. Um, and you were told you, you can only have a maximum of two personal cars. I've heard the same information. So I've heard the same. So, you know, I'll tell you this, um, if that's the case, let's think about this. The best route for you get the venture X, you already have the venture one. in the Quicksilver. See, the thing is personally, I, when I go through the, that, uh, pr the product change landing page, I have access to the venture X. So I know it's, uh, it's a possible upgrade path from the Quicksilver to the venture X. Um, the only other way that I can think of is, is having to cancel one of those cards and then reapply it at a, at a later date. But maybe because those are older, you don't want to do that. Um, your status may change in the future. You might, you might want to give it some time. I don't, I'm not sure how to, uh, how to proceed, uh, from there, uh, because I know there, there was one point in time where with my Quicksilver card, the only cards I was eligible to upgrade to were like, that, that I had uh, different cards. Like I had the Venture, it wasn't the Venture X at the time. So I, I know that can change in the future. All right, Usama said, what's the best way to increase your credit limit on the main banks? And which one you recommend for business like for rookies? Ooh, well, Listen, for, for most, if you're talking about like, uh, you know, Capital One, Discover, Chase, Amex, the, they mostly go by usage. So they want to see high usage on those credit cards to that. That's like the main indicator of, of increasing your limit. They just want to see you using the card. They, they get paid, you know, up to 3%, uh, per transaction. Those are called, um, um, interchange fees and all the merchants have to pay that fee when you use the card to buy things. So using the card is going to be your number one. Um, and then depending on which credit card issuer you are focusing on is going to, is going to be kind of, you're going to have to tailor make your strategy based on 
that credit card issuer. So for example, with the Quicksilver card with Capital One, I've seen people use the strategy of using the balance transfer offer to transfer balances from other cards just to put more cash flow. And it, it seems to be another indicator to Capital One that you're, you're putting high usage and you're using the feature that they're offering. And so listen, these credit card issuers are offering you these products for a reason. It's because they're profitable and they want to get you using those. Now for business, I think, uh, Danny, you said Amex. I see a lot of people, a lot of people use Amex. I've seen a lot of people use the Capital One Spark card. That's a 2% flat rate card for business. Uh, but Amex is good too. Mr. Rubio, what's up? You're late. Listen, you're still here, dude. We're still in the middle of it. We got some time left. City Custom Cash Card. Is three hard inquiries too much to apply? I think three is... Uh, if I can remember back to a video, I know that City is a little bit, um, they're a little bit of a stickler for inquiries, but three, three is very, is still good. I think you'll be good with that because I think that was the limit for what they wanted to see. You definitely want to have um, the fewer the better, but three is not too much. That's a good amount. Okay, Cheryl, you're saying Amex as well. I think everybody looks like they're in agreement. Amex is the way to go for business. And you're saying Capital One Spark uh, car reports to your personal line of credit. Not a fan. Okay, that's a very valid point there. I like it. Who's into speaking of business? Who has actually um, is trying to start a business? I I was trying to determine this uh, from my latest poll. If that was a strong interest from you guys, are you are you trying to get business funding? Are you trying to establish your own, uh, you know, your own business at this time? Danny, you're saying, I don't mind business credit card videos, but I'm more for personal credit. Okay, I hear that. Osama. I'm on that point trying to stabling. You're stabling it. You're not from this country. Okay. Cheryl, you got an LLC, but you're not really using it.
guys i want to let you know that um i'm working my next video i'm working on what's in my wallet you know i got a pretty deep i got a pretty deep wallet here it's kind of you know i might fill this thing up keep it all together but i'm gonna let you guys know kind of my my overall strategy the cards i really use the most and the ones i keep to the side and my general strategy uh, so look forward to that video it's going to be coming very soon danny listen danny, you said all those cars there you got more cars than me danny listen don't let danny fool you he's got a ton ton of cars there Oh, Raul, you're saying how long is my credit history? Ooh, let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna have to take a, I'm gonna take a look at that. It's been a while since I've answered that question. It's, a, you know, it's over 10 years. Um, I'll tell you this, and my, the, the, the moment that I really got into credit cards was when the, the initial Uber credit card launched. For some reason, I got hooked into, I kind of got caught into that net. Maybe it was marketing. I, I started getting into kind of Graham Stephan and all of the, um, and, and, and finance YouTube. Started watching that content. I got hooked. I started seeing the vision. I saw, I saw the potential there. And my first real, the first card I started using heavily was that Uber card. It was really good to begin with because it got like 4% in uh, back in travel, it had like a $200 sign up bonus or maybe more than that. So I was really loving, uh, that as my only card. Then I got the chase freedom unlimited from there and the rest is history. So that was about, you know, four or five years ago. Unfortunately, they completely nerfed that card and now it's, it's, it's non-existent. They, they product changed it and they, they switched over to the, to Barclays. Frager Hoskin, what is up? You saying, what do you think about the Apple credit card? I think it's good. A lot of people downplay it. It's been a lot of, um, the reason I like the Apple card and I personally don't have it, so I don't have a dog in this fight, but it's, it's basically a 2% flat rate card because you can earn 2% cash back and that's daily cash back. So you're basically earn that the next day you get access to that money uh, because you earn that 2% anywhere Apple Pay is available. So, and that's most large retailers. It's, it's available all over the place and online. And then I like it because you, you, it's a soft pull to qualify and you see what the uh, credit limit they'll give you from the beginning. So if you see they'll, they're giving you a $500 limit and you're like, listen, I'll go to Discover or somewhere else it's going to give me a higher limit. You can do that and it doesn't affect your uh, credit score. Also, Goldman Sachs has proven over time that they will increase your limit um, even on a monthly basis. So you can ask every single month if you want and they're going to, you know, as long as you're using the card, they're going to keep giving you increases and they won't hold you back. You can get up to $20,000 in in pretty quickly. So that's why I like it. All right, guys, it was fun hanging out this weekend. I uh, will be live again next Sunday at 7 p.m. So listen, check for me there. Everybody.
All right, Usama, I didn't want to leave you hanging there. So you're saying, what's the best way to get approved for an increase? Yeah, again, is you want to focus first on the usage. Basically, you want to focus on that one card. So leave all your other cards to the side. Make that one card that you're trying to increase the limit on top of wallet. Just use that card. And it's going to be at least for a three to six month period that you're going to use it like that for. If there, there, if there are any offers available that you can get use out of, use those those offers that they're they're giving to you from that from that credit card issuer. I would do that. And then um, if you have access to product changes, if you have if there's a better card that is available to you, you want to use that. You know, possibly if they have a checking account, you want to sign up for that. If you can get any use out of it. Um, and so the just the idea is just identifying what are the what are the multiple ways that you can basically um, use the card and use the features, all the features that the card allows you to. And that's just going to give indicator after indicator that you're a loyal, profitable customer. OK, that's the that's the way I would go about it. All right, guys, listen, I'm going to head out. You guys have a great night and I'll see you next week.